the first non-ugly Kia Sportage in many years. Finally. Like, deep down, I kind of knew they could do it. So, if you're in the market tossing this up, I bet you've already watched endless reviews on this vehicle. But this one is going to be different, I promise. Coming up, 10 things I love, plus totally unvarnished, 10 things I hate about the new MY22 Kia Sportage. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can click the card that's intermittently up there now. Dude, this video is sponsored by Olite Black Friday sale tonight at 8 p.m. That's Thursday, November 25, 2021, just a month away from Christmas. Details coming up, link in the description, plus a discount code if you miss the sale. Pro tip for regular viewers, the mighty swivel is back. But get in quick on that one because, dude, they always sell out. It's a brilliant home workshop and roadside repair light that I have previously reviewed. Super affordable. Link in the description. Details to come. So, on reviews, okay, I don't know about you, but I am utterly sick of seeing all this faking it in the media. And I'm on a quest here and now to have the most authentic possible dialogue with you about this vehicle. So, just to spell it out, I attended the Sportage media launch recently in Australia. I drove the low-spec 2.0-litre Atmo petrol auto front drive and the top-spec GT line all-wheel drive in both 1.6 turbo petrol and 2.0-litre turbo diesel. That's about five hours of driving all up, evenly split in between those three variants. And then, of course, there was the obligatory seven or eight hour PowerPoint product presentation, more or less. No! No! Time does tend to dilate during those things, and I'm certain that it only seems like half an hour or something to a casual external observer. Anyway, my comments here all stem from that experience, plus a little independent research I did on my own, which car makers hate journalists doing traditionally. I'm going to run some video of the vehicle to give you a solid opportunity to peruse the MY22 Sportage porn while listening to my head speaking words. The Sportage porn you will see was all supplied by Kia. They don't call it that, of course. I'm just pointing this out in case you notice any doubling up between the shots here and on, I don't know, Chasing Cars or Cars Guide or something. That's why. We're all, in this sense at least, equal opportunity sportage video pornography pimps, at least metaphorically. Now, at the outset, I must point out, when you buy a car, what you need to do is you need to fall in love with the things that you love about that vehicle. Not hard. But then you also need to tolerate the things you hate because you're in this for, I don't know, three or five years or something. It's just like choosing a wife or a dominatrix or a Leatherman or something. Although, obviously, with a dominatrix, the polarity of love and hate tend to be reversed. My other website, dominatrixexpert.com, unless, of course, Albor's got hold of that one early, too. Anyway, so here are the top 10 things I love about the new Sportage intercut with the top 10 things, the top 10 and the top 10 things I hate about it. And I'll leave the ultimate car buying decision to you, obviously, but hopefully this will help you to frame it up better and make the right call. To keep track of the love and hate, if you see the scurvy curing king of the juice somewhere on the screen, it's love, obviously. And to signify hate, Betrutius Maximus, ancient Roman high priest of environmental stewardship, depicted here in traditional ancestral headdress. Spoiler alert, new Sportage is a winner. Dude, if you're in the market for a mid-size SUV, it's a damn good choice, especially the two-litre diesel GT line. The things I love about the Sportage are generally awesome, and the things I hate about it would more or less be tolerable 
for most people. You're going to love the handling of this vehicle, especially on the high-spec 19-inch wheel and tyre package. For the dynamics pervert out there, this vehicle settles down really rapidly into a cornering attitude when you tip it in, and then it just kind of hangs in there. And on the way out, you get the same thing, this rapid transition in reverse, and that is a big trick. It's extremely confidence-inspiring. So I spoke to their domesticated handling wizard, Graham Gambold, at the launch, whom I interviewed here in the Fat Cave somewhat earlier this year while he was tuning this car, incidentally. He tells me that this rapid transition between straight ahead and cornering is in part mostly due to new damper valving design with really clever bleed off characteristics. Less of an on off thing and more progressive, he says. You gotta remember, springs are about keeping the body off the deck, so they're about supporting load, okay? And dampers are about controlling motion. And on both these fronts, but especially motion control, this package is really sweet. However, if you tow anything, don't get yourself fooled by the specs, which will say 1,900 kilos maximum tow capacity for the diesel and 1,650 for the two petrol power plants. Lest this lull you into a false sense of towing security, the limiting factor on all of this for you is likely to be the maximum permitted tow ball download of 100 kilos across the board. So in practice, right, irrespective of the powertrain, if you said that you needed, say, 8% download, like static tow ball download, to ensure reasonable dynamic stability when towing, then that means essentially do not tow a trailer heavier than about 1,250 kilos with your new Sportage. And obviously that's not an insubstantial amount of whatever to tow, nor is it towing some Taj Mahal to Dingo Piss Creek. In practice, it's not going to be possible to exploit the maximum outright tow capacity, especially on the diesel. The GT line is gorgeous, but do yourself a favour, okay? Do not drive the GT line unless you really, really intend to buy it, because the interior in particular is going to sweep you off your feet. It's awesome. The panoramic seamless instrument panel and infotainment display is a huge party piece on this vehicle, like hashtag respect. It's revolutionary among dashboards for a mainstream SUV. And I was somewhat sceptical about the absence of a binnacle, but I can tell you that after driving it in the middle of the day with the sun bright as during November here in Shitsville, melanoma capital of the world, I'm a convert, dude. One minor criticism, however. I think the Speedo and the Taco could have been placed slightly closer together to optimise visibility inside the rim of the steering wheel. But otherwise, it's an absolutely awesome execution. The whole interior, in my view, on the high spec is better than Euro. The flip side of this is, of course, that if you jump out of the GT line in the dealership or something and then into a lesser grade of new Sportage, it does feel kind of poverty. And it's not really poverty at all. It's at best just relative poverty compared with the GT. In absolute terms, it's not poverty at all, okay? But it would be a great way for them to upsell you and get you to spend more than you really wanted to. So if the GT line is a stretch financially, my strong advice is don't sit in it, don't test drive it, don't even approach it, dude. If you do, you're very likely to overspend. And Kia will love that, but you might not for the next three to five years making the payments every month. The GT line though, it is a pretty compelling proposition. Comfort levels, refinement, noise, vibration, and harshness. This thing is fully loaded and beyond good enough to qualify as Euro. And you've got to remember, Euro cars are generally crap at tolerating our uniquely shit Australian roads. Yes. Thankfully, the designated Sportage Media Launch Drive program was actually not some hastily contrived cover-up which was carefully selected to gloss over the vehicle's dynamic deficiencies. We actually drove over some of the shittest roads in Greater Sydney, like target-rich environment, I know, 13 out of 10, however, on my carefully calibrated Sydney Road shittifotometer, which is a much cleverer device, frankly, than Paul Marek's 
on-camera fetish for meaningless dashboard hardness measurement. <laughs> I think you'd agree. If you are from around here, the Sportars Drive took us out through Wiseman's Ferry and then up to Kalnura, and uh, that's actually where Kia does its suspension tuning. And then we went back down the M1 to the CBD, essentially. So I think we peaked at shit road factor 13.2 just outside of Gunderman. Yes! So I can tell you, hand on heart, this new Sportage is a really structurally rigid platform that's tuned Goldilocks for Shitsville. Rough roads, like, dude, it eats them. It feels Euro, even when the roads are anything but. It's comfortable and quiet, and that is something of an achievement. If you're already gagging for this vehicle, dude, you just can't walk in, slap down some cash and drive away like so many other cars. The first allocation of this vehicle is already sold, according to my car buying team, and therefore the process for you is going to be sign a contract, pay a deposit, and sadly, wait. Not unlike many other cars right at the moment, but I had harboured some lingering hope that they'd launch the car with sufficient stock on hand to supply initial demand. Sadly not, however. The rest of the lovey Haiti Sportage review in just a sec, but now Olight. Literally brilliant torches, great supporter of this channel, Excellent build quality, awesome performance, and affordable pricing given the quality. Awesome magnetic charging system across most models too. Great environmental performance, meaning waterproofing and ruggedization. These things last for ages and they handle a bit of a beating. I carried the Warrior Mini every day for months and then I upgraded to the Mini 2, which I carry every day, even here in the Fat Cave. And neither of these torches has ever let me down. I use them every day in the field and in the fat cave and the battery life is phenomenal. Headlining the Olight Black Friday sale kicking off at 8pm tonight, you will see the Warrior X3, which is that one just there, successor to the Warrior X Pro. And this is a great option for the car where you can always have it ready at arm's length or in a go bag. It's an awesome tactical torch. Like 2500 lumens when it's in Star Wars mode and you get there just by giving the tail switch a big hard push and instantly 2500 lumens erupts from the pointy end. That's an upgrade of 400 lumens right there compared with the predecessor. It's also been upgraded to a vibrating battery life indicator. Tiffany does love that feature, I know. I don't know why, but Hey, it retains the tail switch too, which is essential if you're in a high stress situation and you can't fumble around on the barrel to orient yourself to a switch there. The steel strike bezel on the front protects the lens and also features three new zirconium ball bearings evenly spaced on the circumference. This is a glass breaker, right? So the X3 is also a rescue tool that can help you get out of a car if you are trapped inside after a crash or help you get in if someone else is in that predicament. Just remember, you will never get in through the windscreen like this because it's laminated, but the side glass is entirely fair game. The pro tips there, okay? Go in on the other side from anyone trapped if you can, because you don't want to spray them in the face with shattered glass. And secondly, no matter how intuitively tempting it might be to hit the glass in the middle, Locate one of the top corners and hit it there, okay? The side glass is tempered and the residual stresses on the surface are the most poorly resolved in the corners. This is the tempered glass equivalent of an Achilles heel. Take a couple of dry runs at the strike and then remember to pull back after impact because you don't want to plunge your forearm into any razor sharp glass edges which fail to disintegrate, perhaps because they are held in place by window tinting. The Warrior X3 delivers 2500 super bright lumens for up to two and a half minutes in tactical mode, and then it switches down to 1000 lumens for just over two hours maximum. For general duties, the low power setting is 300 lumens and it'll run like that for eight hours. And by that time, the sun will be back up, won't it? 
Or, if you're trapped in a cave underwater, Electric Jesus will have rescued you by then in his little yellow submarine, before defaming actual rescuers because... billionaire boy child, just saying. Warrior X3 is IPX8 on waterproofing and drop tested to 2 metres and it weighs just over a quarter of a kilo. 30% off for the next few days during the sale, link in the description and 10% off using the code in the description if you miss the Black Friday sale, perhaps because you are ill-advisedly not yet subscribed, which is... Dude, so easy to fix. Also, Olite will randomly select three auto expert customers and refund 100% of their purchases just like that. Christmas is, of course, just around the corner, dude. The engines, okay? Essentially, we've seen them all before, but they are quite evolved in this iteration in terms of efficiency, fuel economy, etc. The diesel in particular is a real stormtrooper. Like, I jumped out of the 1.6 turbo petrol and into the diesel at Wiseman's Ferry and I was instantly confronted by a wall, like a wall of extra low RPM power compared with the turbo petrol. And even though they've done quite a nice job on the software control for the DCT and the turbo petrol, there is something pretty satisfying about the extra low end power of the diesel and the drive characteristics of the conventional auto to which it's mated. The diesel is profoundly more powerful in the mid-revs, and I certainly know which engine I'd be buying if I were in the market now. A senior Kia executive, whom I will not name, Roland Rivero, devoted a whole chapter to engine optimization during his 13-hour presentation on the vehicle. I had intended to thank him for that, but I lost the will to live, frankly, about nine hours in. So that's unfortunate. When I reviewed the presentation via Ouija board from the afterlife, R Squared told me that they had managed to achieve an 18% reduction in fuel consumption on the 1.6 turbo. <laughs> yes, with a commensurate cut in CO2, of course. A small round of applause, I thought from the grave. Unfortunately, Sneaky Rivero, as I intend to call him henceforth, conveniently neglected to mention the reduction in fuel tank capacity with this new model. Perhaps he said it while I was all sort of shredding his cat during the Prezzo, I don't know. Anyway, fuel tank capacity is down from 62 litres in the one they just guillotined to 54 litres with this one. Eight litres down, or a reduction of 13%. And, <laughs> I can agree, that's a shame. But at least they have done a good job stopping the new girl getting all lardy assed Tear mass has only increased by about 20 kilos, despite the shiny new one being bigger everywhere and, let's face it, fully loaded. That's emblematic of structural design optimization right there. So well done design dudes. And they have used a lot of high tech sort of hot formed ultra high strength steel with this platform. The Piano Black. Inside. It's everywhere and it's awful but especially on the centre console. It looks great on the showroom floor, don't get me wrong, it's an aesthetic triumph during the procurement process but you'll just have to look at it the wrong way or, heaven forbid, touch it with even the softest microfiber cloth ever contrived by humanity and it's going to look like you've been playing ice hockey on it, dude. Guaranteed to be the most visually hideous feature of the vehicle in the medium term from roughly the second week of ownership, in my estimation. It gets biffed down there by rings and keys and phones and coffee and cables endlessly in that location and it's really not up to that as a material in the context of reasonable endurance and ongoing aesthetic presentation. But the rotary transmission selector on that piano black down there in the console, it's a delight to use, okay? You don't have to take your eyes off the outside world to shift ratios to go forwards or backwards. A brilliant piece of space-efficient ergonomic design that incorporates electronic switching but makes it tactile and intuitive, and don't we all want that? Twist left for reverse and right for forwards. I mean, ScoMo would struggle with that, of course, but 
You and I, we're going to be just fine with it in seconds. Minimal adaptation required. It's just good to go. Dude, this setup is infinitely better than Hyundai's take on activating the same transmissions in the same generation of vehicles. Theirs involves, of course, far less instinctive push buttons. But sadly, even this is a good news, bad news story because the detailed design on that rotary switch is awful, at least in one respect. Here in beautifully sunny Schittsville, the concave top surface of that rotary switch becomes a de facto parabolic reflector that catches the sun from seemingly every angle and bounces it inconveniently right back into yo eyes, which is unpleasant as you through the scenery. All the sun has to do to aid and abet this inconvenience is be up there in the sky and slightly ahead of you and not hindered by clouds or smog or something. I urge Kia's interior designers to bring their future prototypes to sunny downtown Schittsville and visit the beach or the bush and just see how they roll with the friggin' sun. Full-size spare tyre across the board. Yes, big win for regional Schittsvillian owners and long-distance drivers generally. Take that, I say, RAV4, CX-5, X-Trail, and just about every Euro SUV. This is a huge triumph for us. Now, the 1.6 turbo petrol engine. This is quite okay in isolation, it goes quite well. However, Mazda's 2.5 turbo petrol engine in the direct competitor, the CX-5, it murders it, like murders it. And frankly, it's the kind of murder where it takes the medical examiner several days of diligent hard work to reassemble the body, frankly. So I really do think it's time for Hyundai Kia to bite the bullet and build a version of perhaps their existing 2.4 Atmo engine, but with forced induction and all the other cool combustion control features if they want to remain competitive in the premium petrol competition space. Happily, capped price servicing on this car means exactly that. Kia assures me that if you buy that car tomorrow, meaning go on the waiting list like every other friggin' car, then the servicing prices quoted at the time you purchase it will not change for the term of that agreement. So you're going to know exactly what you are up for service-wise for the standard service items, which don't include wear and tear stuff, obviously, and that these known pre-quoted prices will not be subject to some arbitrary rubbery figure fudge year on year as they are with some competing brands. Unfortunately, a hybrid is just a pipe dream, at least for us, for whatever reason, but mainly because our soft cock regulatory framework, frankly, does not compel manufacturers to sell their low emissions models here in Australia. So well done, governments and regulators. Kia Australia finds it very difficult to implement the hybrid here on the basis of economic rationalism alone, which gobsmacks me, frankly, because how many hybrid sales do you reckon they might immediately poach from Toyota with a Sportage hybrid? Especially as Toyota cannot actually manage to deliver any RAV4 hybrids right at the moment. This is the first non-hideous Sportage for years. <laughs> it's finally... I mean, the last one was properly Fright Night, wasn't it? And this one, especially in the high grades, is pretty compelling. King of the Juice agrees. I prayed to him and he got back to me, which is a red letter thing anyway. And he's always right. Like, dude, that's in the book. Now, I may have been deceased at this point, but if memory serves... Sneaky Roland seemingly also forgot to mention that the turning circle on this vehicle appears to have grown from 11 metres flat to 11.76, despite a tiny weenie reduction of about 15 millimetres in wheelbase. So the upshot of this is somewhat less manoeuvrability in big cities. Golly gee, Jim Bob. It's almost as if they selectively edit these endless presentations to include only the positives, isn't it?
Imagine that. Happily, there's even a manual transmission available. Yes. Okay, most people don't actually want that anymore, and it is available only on the low specs sort of poverty there end, and it's only there because they bothered to make one for the South Korean domestic market. But if you really like to shift gears manually, dude, it's available. Unfortunately, however, if your cog shifting fetish takes you down this path of buying the manual, you will also lose a bunch of safety features that Kia says cannot be integrated with a manual transmission. And perversely, I'm told that the ANCAP rating of the manual will not change compared with all of the other automated gearbox variants, mainly because the features that you will lose by buying the manual are non-critical features insofar as the ANCAP safety rating is concerned. But if you want maximum safety and plush features generally, you cannot have that with a manual transmission. Thank you very much for sticking with me. I know it has been, as they say in the classics, lengthy. Sportage is not perfect, but I'd suggest it is a winner among mid-sized SUVs. If you've got questions, you can reach out to me via the website and I will try to get back to you. Sometimes there is a tsunami and it falls over, but I'll give it a red hot crack. We can, of course, get a discount for you and investigate availability if you want to jump in. Boots and all, Australia only, sadly. Like, dude, I did have these world domination plans, but then the pandemic hit and isn't that always the way? In any case, I hope this report has helped you, has helped nudged you closer to making the right decision. Thank you very much for watching.